normally every time I've watched uh, Nostalgia for the Light, I've had to take a lot of deep breaths and keep quiet. Uh, so it's a little difficult to kind of respond to what's clearly an extremely, extremely moving film. So I've kind of come prepared with some notes because I knew it would be. <clears throat> so almost 40 years ago, Patricia, Patricia Guzman helped redefine political cinema with his landmark trilogy, The Battle of Chile. This film itself was made under extraordinary circumstances with Chris Marker, who passed away two years ago, playing a key role in, in its making. Guzman and his team, who had been documenting the IND uh, revolution, followed, of course, by the coup by Pinochet, uh, <coughs> were fired by Chile films. And since there was a ban on the importation of raw stock, there was no way that they could actually make films. And he had met Chris Marker uh, when Chris Marker was in, in, in Chile and had really liked his films. Uh, so he wrote to Chris Marker and told him about his, his situation. And a month later, uh, in the mailbox, he received 43,000 feet of film, uh, which Marker had sent him. And he used that to make The Battle of Chile. Now, the first part of this trilogy ends with a chilling and a very haunting moment where the Argentinian cameraman Leonardo Hendrickson films his own death. Basically, what happens is they, they're shooting the arrival of the army in Santiago, and uh, <clears throat> the army officers tell them to move away and stop filming, and they refuse to. And then you see in the film an image of one of the army officers pointing a gun, firing. And then the next image that you see is basically a blankness and a white light that fills the screen. Because what has happened is Hendrickson has fallen down while his camera is still rolling, but now it's tilted up towards the sky, and all you see is this white light. And I want to take this moment because, of course, Hendrickson wasn't the only person who, who died. The other cameraman, or the main cameraman in the film, Jorge Mula Silva, uh, was subsequently arrested by Pinochet and he was executed as well. And I want to use these two enjoined motives as a way of opening up a few questions around nostalgia for the light, namely the missing body and the emerging light, since they seem to be central to engaging with a filmmaker whose work has been concerned with questions of disappearances, memory and justice <clears throat> on the one hand, and the ability of films, a medium that writes by light, to serve simultaneously as testimony, as indictment, and as hope. Let me begin with this question of light. In his Confessions, St. Augustine, writing about death, uses a metaphor of a loss of sight, and he says, My eyes sought him everywhere, but they could not see him, and I hated all the places because he was not in them. They could not say to me, Look, he is coming, as they did when he was alive and absent. I became a hard riddle to myself. In Augustine's account, death emerges as the ultimate deprivation of a vision of the other. What disappears from sight is literally the sight of another, gesturing, therefore, to a loss of light. And what Eugenia, <coughs> Eugenie Brinkema elsewhere describes as the illuminating possibilities of vision. The prevalence of the photograph as a visual reminder, especially of those who disappeared, without closure, testifies to the persistence of holding on to a vision. This becomes all the more crucial in the case of extrajudicial killings or disappearances, where the image or the photograph stands in place of the missing body. Thus, when the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo in Argentina walk around the circle, endlessly adorning themselves with pictures of their missing children, or when the women in Chile dig the Atacama Desert in search of the skeletons of their loved ones, they are reenacting a ritual, one that started with Antigone, refusing to obey Creon's diktat that Polynices' body should be abandoned without a proper burial. Grieving thus involves the ontological loss of the other, figured through the sensual loss of vision of the other, culminating in a way in a radical transformation of the possibilities of a vision based on illumination, illumination and presence altogether. Griselda Gambaro, the Argentinian playwright, who merged the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo with Antigone in her play Antigona Furiosa, references this act of doubling with the photograph when she has Antigone walk around the stage in circles with a picture of Polynices, proclaiming at the end of the play, I still want to bury Polynices. I will always want to bury Polynices. 
though a thousand times, <clears throat> though I a thousand times will live, and he a thousand times will die. Let's return, via Antigone, to the question of light and film. Every loss of being is also fundamentally a loss of light. An expulsion into darkness, as Brinkema in her work on affect and form suggests, grief re refigures seeing as envisioning without enlightenment, as though looking through dead eyes into which no light can be taken, on which no image can imprint its rays, the end of optic is of a sensual encounter with a present existent world. What then are we to make of Henriksen's camera at the moment where the erasure of sight nonetheless captures light? The emergence of film and photography in the 20th century as technologies of witnessing seem to pose a philosophical conundrum for the thinking of death and vision. The etymological enjoining of light and writing in photography, you know, photography literally is writing by light, shows it to be a technology that writes by light and also renders a writing of light. And nowhere is this conundrum more philosophically and poetically explored than in Guzman's Nostalgia for the Light. Filmers have always had an uncanny relationship to death, where unlike the photograph which captures a moment in time, film animates the death through motion, and it has to do this within the formal problematic of presence and absence. Grief is usually posed as a problem in film via the paradox of Augustine's sorrow. I looked for presence, but I found nothing, or I saw nothing. Brinkema beautifully describes this as the habeas corpus drive in cinema. For those unfamiliar with the law, habeas corpus is a, a writ that demands the body to be made present. So as a habeas corpus drive in cinema, a term particularly suited in my mind for the work of someone like Patricia Guzman, nostalgia for the light in dealing with the absent body turns attention instead to stars and to light, to create a cinematic vocabulary that attempts to mold the texture of light into an idiom of pain. In an interview given in 2012, Guzman says, in the desert, you can film only in the morning and in the evening. The sun is too powerful in the middle of the day. So at that time, when we couldn't film in the desert, we chose to film little things, little details, tiny stones, rays of light, reflections, shadows, cracks between objects and their undersides. The resulting images of substances of materiality look abstract, and it's really quite impressive. We took masses of shots like that. We weren't sure why, but that's how the documentary developed. You look intuitively with film, and you find the theme. Sometimes it's successful, sometimes it's not. But that dust becomes fundamental. We found a big astronomical cupola from which the telescope had been removed. It was disused and actually full of rubbish. When I saw that space, I saw the whole process of the coup d'etat in the destruction and the absence of what was supposed to be there. I saw this dustbin place as a metaphor. It was thick with dust. But that's what you need to do with documentary cinema. It's a path you have to discover and explore. You don't know where it will lead, if anywhere at all, but the process is often very moving. If these three forms of searching, the astro astronomers looking far into space, the archaeologists looking deep into the ground, and the women searching for the remains of the disappeared, serve as the quest for meaning and truth in the film, then it is light and dust which brings them together. Guzman's reflections on dust and the film's use of stardust as a recurring metaphor reminds us that memory, whether private or public, like film, like archaeology, and like, geo like, like uh, astronomy, is also mediated. When Violeta says, I wish the telescopes didn't just look into the sky, but could also see through the earth so that we could find them. She is referencing not just the stubbornness and material opacity of the earth, but also the challenges of transmitting memory across time and space and across matter. When the Atacama Desert is the largest natural archive of matter in the hands of the astronomers, the archaeologists, and the women, the physical and spatial substance of matter gets transformed into a temporal dimension, one in which it is not the smooth surface, but the cracks, the fissures in the ground that that ground memory into space. Nora Zigwari writes, for example, all light takes an interval of time to reach our eyes. All we perceive pertains to the past, and we are left with the elusive and malleable mem memory of that past in every present perception. Memory, not unlike light, is a mirage. It belongs to the past and constantly penetrates the present tense of our perceptions with its forceful illusions. In Guzman's masterful hands, these varying rhythms of time of the moment and of infinity, 
becomes overlapping puzzles of existence and experience. How are we to measure the passage of time? Is it the shortest unit of light coming to our eyes? Is it the ability of machines to hear sonic radiation from, from a billion years ago? Is it the number of years we have spent for the remain, looking for the remains of our loved ones? Or the number of days, months, or years that we have left knowing that our bodies are frail and not as healthy as they were 20 years ago? Or is the intensity of hope that keeps us going day after day in search of that which we know we cannot find, and even if we do find, could not entirely make sense of? If machines strive to measure the immeasurable, we also have an architect who measures his steps, committing every step he has taken to memory so that he may reconstruct in an unforeseeable future the memory of those who will not see a future. These architects and sky watchers who found a little bit of freedom in the stars, these distant constellations, <coughs> uh, these <coughs> who found a little freedom in the stars, trace these distant constellations as intimately as they trace the fading names of those who no longer exist, on walls which will eventually crumble into dust, and yet the moving finger wears down the obstinacy of time and matter, bringing them closer to us and to anyone who cares to hear or listen. If the architect measures by feet using his feet, the women measure by feet, by finger, by skulls, they measure even if they no, no longer count the days, but measure they must because they must remind us that even as machines measure further and deeper, there still remains the singularity of an individual life lost which remains immeasurable and outside any rational calculus of measure, either as retribution, as restoration, or as redemption. To work within an al algebraic logic of calculation, it still remains susceptible <coughs> to the demands of the singular and the immeasurable. And it is to this boundlessness of time, space, and memory that Guzman pits the frailty of the individual quest. In what is perhaps the most famous image from moral philosophy, Immanuel Kant writes, two things awe me the most, the scary sky above me and the moral law within me. If the starry sky for Kant serves as the absolute image of the sublime, which overwhelms a human's experience of herself, it is also an image of the open as a horizon of the immeasurable. In Guzman, the open often emerges as a flash of light. Thus the film which opens with the close workings of a tel telescope with its emphasis on the precision of measurement, slowly gives away to a blinding flash of light. In nostalgia for the light, space and infinity may even be measured, but it is a tiny fragment of a single life and the need to be made whole, which emerges as the real challenge of thinking the measure of our lives. In his lectures on the ancient Greek philosopher Her Heraclitus, Heidegger suggests that a poetic measure may be one way of learning to dwell within the open. It is an attitude or a sensibility, he says, that reconciles itself towards that which exceeds any calculable measuring. In other words, a measure which thinks not in terms of distance, depth, height, or amplitude, but in terms of our very relation to being. Poetic measure is thought less than as a normative standard than as a measure attuned to the immeasurability of being's withdrawal of its play of presence and absence. To think this measure poetically is to gain an opening into an originary site, an originary dwelling, an ethos that, hold, that, that holds us open to the unfolding and withholding of being. I would suggest that Guzman allows us a similar poetic measure, an invitation written in light to dwell, to ponder, but also to make our peace with the immeasurable. If the poetic is a form of dwelling through which human, human beings receive the measure for the expanse of their being, the nostalgia for the light also places its concerns with questions of justice within a wider world of dwelling and time, one not limited by a juridical lexicon of balance and ethics. The quest of justice when enjoined poetically into a mode of dwelling continues to look for lost bones, even as it deciphers the dust left behind its spoons and bottles. It listens to the music of the world produced by the wind, using spoons as its instruments. And in the midst of this, it reconciles sometimes to looking through measuring machines into that distant open, connecting the bones to the stars with the common element calcium, knowing that one cannot be comprehended without the other. Finally, Guzman allows us to return to one of the etymological roots of the word form, which derives from to gleam or to sparkle. And the purity of nostalgia for the light sparkles with a rare moral and imaginative conviction, which in the, these increasingly dark times that we live in, can only, we can only be thankful for. Thank <laughs> you.